Uh, welcome everyone to this week autonomy talks. This week is a pleasure to have Evdem Bijik. I hope I pronounce it close to correct. Uh, who is a PhD candidate in the electrical engineering department at Stanford University, working with uh, Professor Dorsa Sabi. So um, something about him. Uh, Erdem received his Bachelor of Science uh, degree from Bilkent University in Turkey in 2017, and then his Master's of Science degree from Stanford University uh, two years ago in 2019. His research uh, is, uh, lies around the enabling robots to actively learn from various forms of human feedback, and uh, also is designing adaptive robot policies to improve the efficiency of multi-agent systems both in comparative and competitive settings. Maybe some of you saw his talk of two weeks ago, he gave a talk at the NCCR automation about the more, would say, robotics part of, the, of, of his research. And today instead, he's gonna talk about uh, some mob mobility uh, related matter, uh, namely uh, his talk is titled Learning How to Dynamically Route Autonomous Vehicles on Shared Roads. We are very excited to hear uh, what you're going to talk about, and that the stage is yours, Serdem. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and the intro introduction music too. It was great. Um, so yeah, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Adam Wick. Uh, I'm a PhD candidate at Stanford, and today I want to talk about how reinforcement learning can help reducing traffic congestion with the presence of autonomous cars as well as human-driven cars. And this is a joint work with Daniel Lazar and Ramtin Pedarsani from UC Santa Barbara and my advisor, Dorsa Sarik. Okay. So I think it's needless to say that traffic congestion is a huge problem. It's especially a huge problem in large cities. Here is a video of Thanksgiving Day traffic at Los Angeles from a few years ago. And congestion is not just limited to single events. In 2015, travel delays due to congestion caused US drivers to invest $160 billion in time and fuel. And this doesn't even include pollution. The costs are much greater worldwide and this vest is only increasing. So what can we do to not have to sit in traffic all the time? One way is to increase supply by building roads. However, this is very expensive. For example, this interchange costs $135 million to construct. Another way is to decrease demand by tolling. However, this can be hard to do well. And what I'm going to suggest in this talk is actually orthogonal to this. So they're not substitutes for each other. They can be done together. So what is that thing that I'm suggesting? That is, we can use the new capabilities of autonomous vehicles without having to change existing infrastructure. So car companies had been promising that we would have autonomous vehicles on public roads by 2020. Well, that didn't quite happen, but we are still expecting them soon. So let's try to leverage them for our existing traffic problems. We are not the first people who have thought of using autonomous cars to help with traffic. Starting in 60s, uh, people have been looking at how to control platoons of vehicles. Other works look at smoothing instabilities in congested traffic flow or how to control mob mobility on demand uh, services. And in today's talk, I will focus on how we can leverage autonomous vehicles for lower congestion through routing. I will approach the problem with three different formulations. First, I will focus on a steady state formulation to do some analysis and develop the notion of altruism. And next, I'm going to formulate a dynamic game and propose a reinforcement learning based solution to that. Finally, I'll spend some time talking about some ideas on uh, how we can use pricing mechanisms or incentives to create altruism or claim some control over traffic networks. So let's start with the steady state formulation. Throughout the talk, we will not be thinking about a setting where all cars are autonomous. That would be too easy. Instead, human-driven cars and autonomous cars will coexist. And one important difference between them is people are selfish and they will take the quickest route possible. And this can lead to suboptimal traffic patterns. However, we can incentivize altruism in autonomous vehicles. And this can decrease congestion. 
Incentivizing altruism sounds a little like an oxymoron, but uh, what I mean by that is we can incentivize autonomous cars to get the benefits uh, that are same as altruism. And by utilizing this altruistic autonomy, we can decrease the amount of time everyone spends in traffic. So let's formalize this. Let's consider a network of n parallel roads with some human drivers who are selfish, taking the quickest route available to them, and some autonomous vehicles which may or may not be selfish. We then want to understand what equilibria emerge if all users are selfish. How can we efficiently calculate the best equilibria? And if some autonomous vehicles are altruistic, how do those answers change? So to answer these, we need to first model vehicle flow on shared roads, then establish pro properties of equilibria, and finally compute those equilibria. So let's start with modeling the vehicle flow. And for now, like only for developing the model, let's say there is only a single type of vehicles. Uh, I'm going to relax this assumption later. So let's forget about autonomous vehicles for now. We use the fundamental diagram of traffic to model the dynamics within a road. Let me briefly mention how it works. Here is a road segment that has B lanes and is D meters long. This is a regular human driven car whose length is L meters. And let's say it's going with a speed of V bar meters per second. In driving, we have this rule that drivers must keep some headway distance with the car they are following. And to keep it to keep it general, excuse me, to keep it general, let's say it's tau h seconds. Here, the superscript h will denote the human-driven cars. So, if there is this other car here, then there is going to be at least tau h times v bar meters distance between them. So, this blue block is the area on this uh, road segment occupied by this car. Now the question is, how many of these blue blocks can we fit in the road? Well, just by a simple geometric argument, it's going to be this number here. So as long as there are fewer cars than this, then everyone will go with the nominal speed. They don't need to slow down. Let's put this uh, on a density flow graph. As we increase density up to this critical number, the flow will linearly increase because it's just more cars going with the same nominal speed. Um, and we can also show this on the flow latency plot. Again, the flow will be increasing, but the latency doesn't change because the cars are not slowing down yet. Now, what if there are more cars? We will have to shrink the blue blocks. That means the cars will have to slow down. So we are in the congested regime now. The traffic is not in free flow anymore. Instead, uh, instead of the nominal speed V bar, they will now move with a speed of some V, let's say. So the length of the blue block will be tau h times V. Now, in terms of the number of cars, how long is the new blue block? Well, it's just the total area in the uh, road divided by the number of cars, n. And by setting this equal to the area of the blue block, we can actually get this expression for the car's new speed. So we are able to write the car's new speed as a function of the number of cars on the road. And let's now put this on our graphs. Uh, we can think of flow as the number of cars multiplied uh, with their speed. And if you multiply this speed expression here uh, with, the number of, uh, with the number of cars or like density, uh, so like some, some linear function of n, let's say, uh, we realize that it's going to be a linearly decreasing function of density. Here, the slope of this decrease is called the shock wave speed, and it will come up once more in the dynamic model. And for the second plot, while the flow is decreasing linearly, the speed is decreasing with one over n, as you can see in this expression. So the plot is going to look like this. So this is the fundamental diagram of traffic. 
and we use that to model the vehicle flow within a road in our network. But remember, we said we are only considering a single vehicle type for now. What is the difference between human-driven and autonomous vehicles? Well, autonomous vehicles are equipped with very powerful sensors and they have platooning capabilities. So they can actually keep a shorter headway than the regular human-driven vehicles. In the fundamental diagram, it will look like this for the autonomous vehicles. Now, this means there will be two different blue blocks on a shared road. And luckily, we only need the average. So we can write our critical density as a weighted combination of the two vehicle types, depending on the autonomy level of the road, which is the fraction of autonomous vehicles uh, to, the, to, the entire, to the entire population of vehicles. Um, depending on this uh, autonomy level, we are basically changing the denominator here, the length of the average blue block. And we run some simulations on Sumo, a microscopic traffic simulator, and this model mostly matches with the simulations. Here I'm showing three different autonomy levels and the small mismatches are due to the imperfections like discretizations we have in the program. And we also see the match in the flow latency plots. So this fundamental diagram of traffic is actually a very powerful tool for modeling the patterns in traffic. So having discussed vehicle flow, now we can talk about network level behavior because everything we talked so far is about a single road. Now we want to talk about network level behavior. So we consider equilibrium of selfish users in which no user could benefit from individually switching their strategy. This means that for parallel roads, all used roads have the same latency and unused roads have equal or greater latency. So let me use an example. Uh, so this is an example from Los Angeles. And in this example, we consider going from city to the valley. We have three roads, uh, Coldwater Canyon. Uh, and it, this, is the, this is the quickest route uh, when it's in free flow. Uh, there is the 405, uh, it, which is a little slower. And then there's the Laurel Canyon, which takes 35 minutes in free flow. So if the traffic network is in an equilibrium and I'm taking, let's say, 405, then it means cold water is congested because otherwise I would benefit from individually switching from the 405 to cold water. So in the equilibrium, no selfish users can, uh, can benefit from unilaterally deviating from their current strategy. And the flow latency graph makes it easy to picture equilibria. We can consider a single point on this uh, y-axis and reason about congestion on roads from there. As an example, consider the following equilibrium. Here, there are people on all three roads, uh, meaning that cold water and the 405 must be congested because otherwise no one would be on longer roads, which is lower L. And we have lower L in free flow. Previous work has established properties of best equilibria in, in, in traffic of a single vehicle type and showed that there are a finite number of equilibria. However, in the case of mixed autonomy, where we have both autonomous cars and human-driven cars, we now have an uncountably infinite number of equilibria. And to see this, consider two roads where the solid lines represent the flow latency relationship of the human-driven vehicles and the dashed lines represent that of uh, autonomous vehicles with a mixture of uh, so with a, with a mixture of vehicle types we would have uh, uh, we would have a flow latency graph that's somewhere in between we can have these two equilibria or anything in between the idea is we can swap some portions of autonomous and human driven vehicle population and still remain in an equilibrium so for example on the equilibrium on the left uh, the cold water road is uh, used only by autonomous vehicles. Whereas on the equilibrium on the right, cold water is used only by the humans. So the total demand is the same, but we moved uh, some autonomous vehicles from cold water to the 405 and some human driven vehicles from 405 to the cold water. And uh, we remain in the equilibrium. And we can move 
any like portion of the flow as long as it's feasible. So we have uncountably many uh, equilibria in this case. So the best Nash equilibrium is not unique anymore. But then which one is better? To answer that question, we developed the notion of robustness, which quantifies how much extra unexpected flow of demand can be incorporated without exiting the equilibrium. So for example, uh, because autonomous cars have platooning capabilities and like keeping shorter headways, uh, they can they can be good for robustness because they can uh, enable us to allocate more flow on, onto the roads. And using this definition of equilibria, uh, we developed the properties of best equilibria, which will help our computation later. So one road will be in free flow in the best equilibrium. All roads with lower free flow latency will be congested. And all roads with higher free flow latency will have no flow on them because otherwise it wouldn't be an equilibrium. And before I go into the computation of equilibria, let's also consider this question. What if we could incentivize some autonomous users to not act selfishly? In such a case, we would be able to reach equilibria with lower overall travel delay by sending some autonomous vehicles on longer roads to decongest the shorter roads. Uh, we could do this through pricing, and I'll briefly talk, talk about it at the end. So we developed this notion of altruism profile, which quantifies how much extra time fractions of the population are willing to tolerate. Here, kappa is a multiple of, uh, multiple of the delay of the quickest route available. So in this example, all drivers are willing to uh, tolerate up to a small decay, uh, sorry, a, a small delay kappa zero. Then some drivers get impatient after kappa zero, and as we increase the delay, more and more drivers will not accept the long routes until eventually, at some point, all drivers will refuse. So we have these like different levels of altruism. That's it. And using this, we can have equilibria better than the selfish ones. So if we can get, for example, in this case, if we can get uh, some autonomous users stay on the 405 while others are on the cold water in free flow, then we can have uh, a better equilibrium, something like this. Um, so to summarize, we can use altruism to achieve better equilibria and decrease travel time. And similar to before, we can characterize the best altruistic equilibria as follows. The longest route uh, used by humans may or may not be congested because sometimes you need to keep it congested to uh, satisfy the altruism uh, constraints. And all shorter roads will be congested because otherwise humans would uh, switch to those roads. And all longer roads will be in free flow and they may or may not be used by the autonomous cars, which are altruistic. And with this in mind, let's discuss how to actually compute the equilibrium. So without characterizing the properties of the equilibria, we would have to search all possible equilibrium latencies and then figure out which routing corresponds to the lowest. This leads to a very difficult optimization. However, using the properties of equilibria we established, we shrink our search space to a finite number of linear programs working in polynomial time. We can then find a good equilibrium in O to uh, O n to the four time, where n is the number of roads, and a good equilibrium with altruism in O m times n to the five time, where m is the number of altruism levels. And to show this, like, let's first start with a naive way to compute the best Nash equilibrium. We would minimize the cost function over FH, human driven routing. FA, autonomous routing, and S, the congestion states, subject to flow conservation, non-negative flow, um, respecting road capacities and the equilibrium constraint. This equilibrium constraint here dictates that if a road has flow on it, it must have latency less than or equal to that of the latencies of all roads, because this is our definition for the Nash equilibrium. And this is a very difficult constraint. But 
we simplify this by noting that we will always have one road in free flow. We search for this minimum free flow road by finding the road with the minimum free flow latency that when it's in free flow yields uh, feasible Nash equilibrium. So basically by using the properties we established, which is there's always going to be one road that's in free flow, uh, we can change this optimization and we can loop over, uh, like we, we can first search for this free flow road and then for each such road, we solve the optimization problem, uh, which turns out to be a linear program. Um, so uh, to, formal, to formalize what I'm saying, uh, we run the following feasibility check n times because we have n roads. So we minimize some dummy objective function, again, subject to flow conservation, road capacities, and non-negative flow. But our new equilibrium condition is much simpler now. And we can use this equality constraint to convert this entire thing into a linear program. Um, and it will still be a feasibility problem. And it gives us one of the best Nash equilibria. But we can do a slight alteration to make it give us the robust best Nash equilibrium. Uh, basically, we can change the objective to be the robustness term. I don't have the full expression for robustness for brevity here, but the optimization remains a linear program. Uh, oh, sorry, by the way, this, this has to be minus gamma because we are minimizing. Um, to check our theoretical results, we simulated an example uh, similar, to the uh, similar to the one presented earlier, going from city to the valley, but now with four routes. We did this using uh, Sumo again, and we used the Krauss car following model. And we found the following results. So in these animations, each row is a road. So they're not like lanes. E each one is a road, okay? So this is just a visualization of density. So in a bad Nash equilibrium, all the roads are congested and everyone experiences some like high latency. If we find the robust best Nash equilibrium with all selfish traffic, there is now one free flow road and everyone is moving much faster. What I want you to note is that the demands are the same between these two animations. So the number of cars going in and going out from this road segment is the same between these two. And like with this robust best Nash equilibrium, we can have the traffic flow much like much more smoothly and, and, and faster, of course. And by int introducing altruism, everything has freed up with humans on the shortest routes and autonomous vehicles on different roads according to their altruism levels and delays are lower now. And to put numbers to this, we plot uh, total delay, both theoretical and simulated for different scenarios. You can see that there is a large benefit from considering the best equilibrium with additional benefit from added altruism. Okay, so this is all great and we can achieve lower latencies by computing the best Nash equilibrium of the network and we can further improve using altruism. But these analyses are only for st the steady state. They don't tell us anything about how we reach these steady states. So if all roads were in the steady state, they could stay there and that would be excellent. But realistically, our traffic networks have already some states and routing is not the only deciding factor about the state of the network weather conditions, accidents, and many other factors also change the state of the network. So we need to find a way to move the network from any state to a steady state where delays are low. And for this, we will look at the dynamic formulation. Here, I'm going to reintroduce the traffic dynamics because fundamental diagram of traffic is not enough anymore. And then I'll talk about controlling the routing of autonomous vehicles via reinforcement learning. Okay, let's start with the dynamics. We will again consider a network of shared, ro shared roads, uh, but now each road may or may not have different number of lanes at different segments of the roads, as I'm visualizing here. And we now want to understand in the dynamic case, what equilibria emerge if all users are selfish or if autonomous cars are altruistic. And with the presence of altruistic autonomous cars, how can we efficiently route them to decrease total delay? 
So to mathematically analyze the network dynamics, we partition each road into several cells. We index the roads based on the travel time and the cells from source to destination. We make this partition such that each cell has a fixed uh, number of lanes throughout. So the number of lanes change only between the cells. Um, and it takes one time step to traverse a cell at the maximum allowed speed. The speed limit can be different between the different uh, cells and of course different roads too. Uh, so we will have fundamental diagrams of traffic for each cell now, not each road. So each cell has their own fundamental diagram. And depending on the number of lanes in the cells, these diagrams may be different. And besides, each cell may have different vehicle density and flow at different times. So from the steady state analysis, we know what's happening within a cell, but we also need to study how vehicles move from a cell to the next one. For that, we look at the flow, which quantifies how many cars transit to the next cell within a time step. As an example, let's say this is the fundamental diagram for the sending cell, and this is the receiving cell. The flow between the cells will be limited by three quantities. First, it's going to be limited by the demand from the sending cell. We cannot have more flow than there is in the sending cell. So this is the increasing edge of the fundamental diagram. Secondly, we can never exceed the maximum flow. Even if there are more cars in the sending cell, we will be limited by this capacity. Um, and finally, the flow will also be limited by the supplied sp space in the receiving cell. And that's going to be the decreasing edge of the fundamental diagram. So at any time step, the flow from cell I minus one to I will be the minimum of these three quantities. And this is known as the uh, cell transmission model or CTM for short. And before I go into the reinforcement learning framework, I want to also define some notion of equilibria with this new formulation where we have cells and transitions between them. It will be a good baseline for the reinforcement learning algorithms too. And for this, we first start with a concept that we call road equilibria. So in a road equilibrium, all cells of the road must have equal autonomy because otherwise the fundamental diagrams of the cells would be changing and the road wouldn't be in a steady state. Of course, oscillating equilibria might be possible, but we ignore them for the theoretical analysis of the equilibrium behavior. Now, one thing to note is, if all cells have the same number of lanes and speed limits, we will never have congestion. All cells will reach to the free flow regime. And this is, of course, not interesting. So we will look at the case where the capacity decreases along the road, for example, by a bottleneck cell, just like in this transition here. And for the mathematical analysis only, we make two additional assumptions. First, we assume the speed limit is uniform independently for each road. And second, we assume all roads are parallel and consist of two segments. In the first segment, uh, the cells have large number of lanes, whereas the second segment creates the bottleneck. And this is true for all roads. Um, we will use supersecret uh, B for bottleneck and N for non-bottleneck. And these assumptions lead to a result that says, the only cells that can be congested are the ones that are upstream to the bottleneck. And also each congested cell equally contributes to the latency of uh, latency increase on the road. The equilibria in the road network are then defined in the same way as before. In equilibria, no selfish user has incentive to unilaterally deviate from their current strategy. So if I'm on the middle road here, then there will not be any other roads that are faster than the middle road, because otherwise I would prefer to deviate and switch to that road. And then based on this definition of network equilibria, we can again talk about some properties of it for the case where all vehicles are selfish. In order to guarantee the existence of equilibrium with the CTM model, we model uh, cells as infinitesimally short segments. Then under a best Nash best Nash equilibrium with selfish drivers, um, one road will always be in free flow, 
and all roads with lower latency will be congested as otherwise cars would prefer to switch there. And the remaining roads will have no flow again because otherwise the vehicles there would prefer to switch to the other roads. And you can realize that these are just the same as uh, our simpler analysis in the steady state with the fundamental diagram of traffic. Um, and these properties of roads equilibrium uh, again help are again helpful to compute the best selfish equilibria in an efficient way. I'm not going to dive into the details of this, but let me briefly mention what's happening here. So we know from the properties that the longest road used by the vehicles will be in free flow. Let's call it road K. Uh, in this optimization, the last two constraints are just satisfying the demand uh, of autonomous and human driven vehicles. They are saying the total flow of the cars will be equal to the demands. The more interesting constraint is the first one. On the right-hand side of the equation, we compute the congestion latency of road P. Um, we then set this equal to the left-hand side, which is a function of how lengthy the how, how, how lengthy the congested part of the road is. And this is again a feasibility problem, and we can basically loop over the free flow road K to find the shortest road uh, that makes this feasible. After some algebraic manipulation, we will be looping over linear programs again, which means we can find the best self equilibrium in uh, polynomial time. And similar to before, we can do the same thing for the best altruistic equilibria, and all of these are again similar to the steady state analysis. And at the end, uh, with a similar formulation, best altruistic equilibria can also be computed in polynomial time in the number of available roads. So these equilibrium optimizations give us optimal configurations, but they say nothing about what we should do if the network is in a random state or in a bad equilibrium. So while it's analytically intractable to compute dynamic routing, we propose using reinforcement learning to control the routing of autonomous cars in the network. And before I start talking about the routing of autonomous vehicles, uh, we should look at how selfish drivers choose their roads. Uh, and for that, we use a model from the literature where users learn which road is fastest uh, over time. So here, mu h denotes the random distribution the selfish drivers follow. L is the expected uh, latency of each road, and eta is the learning rate, which can be constant or decaying. So over time, selfish drivers will dynamically move from longer roads to the shorter roads. And, and they are reactive. So if, if a shorter road gets congested, uh, they will now deviate and start using longer roads. And for the routing of autonomous vehicles, we first start with this question. What happens with a bad controller? Like for example, what if autonomous cars controller tries to route all autonomous cars to the shortest road? Or what if the demand is already infeasible? So to model, bad, uh, to model such bad situations, we consider a queue before the network. This queue can consist of both human-driven uh, and autonomous cars, and a good controller would hopefully create a queue, uh, would hopefully not create a queue, and or or at least keep it stable. So we don't want a growing queue. And reinforcement learning also helps us modeling more realistic situations. So first of all, we do not need the assumptions that we did for the analysis of equilibria. So we can model uh, any network topology if it's multiple origin destination pairs. For example, this is the OW network, uh, which is used in the transportation literature. And we also perform experiments on this network using reinforcement learning. Um, we can also incorporate perturbations to the system, for example, accidents. We model them as stochastic events that block lanes on cells, and they are cleared after some random amount of time. And in the end, this is the overall optimization we want to solve. We are trying to find the routing distribution of autonomous vehicles, and because dynamics are too complicated, even involve other optimizations for the transitions from queue to the network, we use reinforcement learning to approximately solve it. Specifically, we employ um, policy gradient methods to come up with a policy that maps the observed states to the actions. For this, we use proximal policy optimization, or PPO for sure, as it's the state-of-the-art policy gradient method with empirical advantages over its competitors. So we have our dynamical system here, 
we give the state observations to this uh, two hidden layer uh, fully connected neural network, and it gives us a uh, discrete distribution of routing for autonomous vehicles. We then use this to route the next autonomous cars uh, that wait in front of the queue. So we first simulated a simple network of parallel roads. Uh, the network with only two roads was easy. When we increase the number of roads to three, this is what we get. The plot on top shows the cost during the training of the RL policy. You can see that it's decreasing. In fact, the bottom plot shows the RL policy uh, achieves a stable cost. It's the, it's the uh, solid line here. Um, so the number of cars in the network is nearly constant. But if you look at the dotted line, which is what happens when all cars are selfish, you can see that this is actually a difficult problem and the number of cars keep increasing. So we have a linearly growing queue. And the difference is even more significant with four parallel roads. Then the dashed line in the bottom, uh, this dashed line here, um, shows the optimal equilibrium in the steady state, which, which we can uh, compute using linear programs. And you can see that RL solution keeps only a marginal difference with that. But more importantly, RL solution starts from a random network state. So it's actually telling us how to reach good equilibria. And we did an example study on this uh, three road network from Los Angeles again, and we simulated each road with a bottleneck segment. And to make it difficult, we try allocating a demand that's 95% of the maximum feasible demand. Here, I'm going to show the results under different autonomy levels. As we decrease autonomy, the problem gets more difficult. But the RL solution is still able to handle the demand. When we further decrease the autonomy, the problem becomes infeasible. So there is no way we don't get a growing queue, as you can also see from the dashed line, which is the optimal uh, steady state. But the RL solution still achieves to keep a, only a marginal difference to the optimal steady state routing. And we can further reduce autonomy. It's still a marginal difference. And we also investigated the effect of perturbations. So here is the plot uh, without any accidents. Then we enable accidents in simulations. This is what we get. Here, the orange blocks on the x-axis show when some lanes were closed due to accidents. You can see that the last accident uh, causes some congestion in the RL solution. But as soon as it's cleared, the RL policy is able to move the system back to the near optimal equilibrium. Here is a more detailed visual of the results. First three plots here uh, show the number of cars in the roads. And from bottom to uh, top, you can think of these as uh, cells from origin to destination. Like you can see that selfish, with selfish vehicles, the third road is very rarely utilized. It's used only when there are accidents or extreme congestion on the other roads, as it's, as it's happening here. Um, this causes a linearly growing queue, as you can see in the bottom plot. But when we use the RL policy, this is what we get. Also, like in, in, the, in the previous plot, you can see that the y-axis for the queue goes to 40,000 cars in like six hours. Whereas in this case, y-axis is like up to 200. Uh, so with RL policy, this is what we get. And like you can see that the third road is being well utilized and the queue is stabilized. Um, we can also see some interesting events here. For example, uh, when the third accident here uh, occurs on the third road, the RL policy temporarily starts routing the cars to the first road. This causes some temporary congestion there, but as soon as the accident is cleared, the policy moves things uh, back to normal. And space-time diagrams are also useful to show the same phenomenon. Again, the third road is uh, not utilized when all cars are selfish, but RL policy uses all roads. Okay. And finally, here are the results with the OW network that I showed before. And here, here we don't have the optimal solution uh, because the network is not parallel. Uh, but as a baseline, we also implement the greedy optimization solution. Here, the stage cost shows the number of cars in the network. You can see that the RL solution, again, handles the demand, whereas other policies cause uh, growing queues. 
So to summarize, we use reinforcement learning to control the routing decisions of autonomous vehicles uh, to help decrease congestion for all users. And going back to this diagram, I talked about steady state analysis and a dynamic formulation. Reinforcement learning solution enabled us to make the network move from a bad state to a good equilibrium. But it requires a strong assumption. And that is, we have control over the routing of autonomous vehicles. This itself is not very realistic. So I now want to talk about how we can use pricing to indirectly have control over the network. For this, we will first use ideas from preference-based learning to learn price latency trade-offs, and then use these learned trade-offs uh, for pricing to reduce congestion. These are some preliminary ideas, and we developed them only for the steady state formulation for now, but similar ideas can be extended to the dynamic game formulations too. So let's start with how we learn trade-offs. The underlying idea is simple. Consider ride-hailing services like Uber and Lyft. They give us multiple commute options with different latencies, comfort levels, prices, number of passengers, etc. And for, for, for our analysis, let's just focus on prices and latencies. Every time we make a selection in these apps, we are actually giving information about what our price latency trade-off is like. And our idea is these ride-hailing apps are planning to operate their own autonomous vehicles so they can actually control some portion of the traffic network through pricing. They can, for example, make their cars uh, take longer routes and make the passenger pay less. And in this way, the congestion will decrease for everybody. Let's again consider this scenario. Uh, we are presented with two options with different prices and latencies. Uh, the latencies are similar to before. Um, so the, the 405 and Laurel, they both cost $15. Uh, and now cold water costs $20. Uh, but the cold water is the fastest road. So would we all choose the same option? Probably no. It's all personal. Like some of us are graduate students, so we will just take the cheapest option, whereas the professors might be willing to pay more to save some time. But there is one thing that I'm sure about. No one in this call uh, would no one in this call would choose the road laurel. And why is that? Because it has the same price as 405, but takes longer. So we define the sets of dominated and undominated roads. In this case, Laurel is dominated by 405, Coldwater and the 405 are undominated. So there are really two variables that we think about here, latency and price. We model each human as an agent who optimizes a reward function as I showed here. So this is human J, and we are looking at the reward if he chooses road I. The first case simply says, he gets a minus infinity reward if road I is a dominated option, because that selection is irrational. The second case suggests that for all other options, the reward will be a linear combination of road I's latency uh, and price. As we prefer lower latencies and prices, the omegas will be uh, the omegas will be positive. Finally, the last case is the reward if the user declines the service and takes an alternative mode of transportation. For example, he would rather be walking. LW here is the walking time, and zeta is just another parameter. So we have three personal parameters, omega one, omega two, and zeta for each user. So we will need to learn these three parameters. And using this reward function, we want to model the probability of user J choosing road I. And for that, we use uh, the softmax model from psychology literature or behavioral economics. Uh, simply, each choice, uh, each choice probability is proportional to the exponential of the associated reward. Now, what if we have many users, each with their uh, individual parameters? Let's say we learn the joint distribution over the three parameters for this population. We want to know the ratio of users who would choose road I. For that, we will just need to integrate over parameters. The probability term here is just the human choice model uh, I introduced in the previous slide. Okay, but how do we learn the parameters? 
we will take a Bayesian approach for that. So let's say we have some previous data for user J and we know that he, like, we know what he chose over what. Let's call this data D. What we want is the posterior distribution of the parameters given this data D. Then uh, because the data points are conditionally independent, um, so we, we first use the base rule and then we use this conditional independence, we get this product term. Uh, the first term here is just the prior and the product involves probabilities of the human choice model, which is the softmax model. So finally, we now know how to learn the parameters, but we are also interested in what the next query should be. By query, I mean a question like this. Which transportation option would you pick? Finding the optimal query is important because autonomous vehicle service may want to initiate each user with some simulated questions, or they can have special promotions for the users where they learn a lot about the user's preference uh, with limited data. So we follow the previous work on active learning to come up with the optimal next query. According to that, the query that maximizes the difference between the prior and the expected unnormalized posterior will accelerate learning. So we analyzed how well we are able to learn the human preference uh, parameters omega-1, omega-2, and zeta with this active learning framework. We simulated users with different parameters and asked them 200 actively generated questions. Here I'm showing you the results of uh, one simulated user. Each line shows the signed difference between the estimated and true values. As you can see, all parameters are overestimated initially. Um, and this is because there exists a set of parameters that explain the noisy selections as noiseless preferences. But as we query more, the learning model has to admit some noise, so it converts to the true values. What's interesting here is that even when we overestimate uh, the parameters, the ratios between the parameters are learned well. And this is important because it means we are able to learn the price latency trade-off well, we are just not sure about how, the, how, how noisy the user is. And to check if this claim is true, we measured the error between the ratios. As you can see in these plots, we were able to learn the ratio pretty quickly with, with, only, with only like 10 queries. This plot also shows active querying indeed accelerates learning over random querying. So we now have a method of learning how humans value time and money. Then we are ready to optimize the prices to incentivize cars to reduce traffic congestion. Basically, we want to minimize the average latency experienced by all users of the road, both human drivers and autonomous users. Of course, we have to satisfy several constraints, road dynamics, human choice model, some profit constraints to make sure the right hailing service is making profit, and selfishness of uh, human drivers. But if you just want to minimize the latency, then the optimal solution will just have very high prices for all roads, because this will cause autonomous users to decline the service and the latencies for the human drivers will decrease. So to prevent this, we should also try to maximize the flow we are routing. So we just add the second, second term to, uh, to the objective. The most straightforward way to, uh, like the most straightforward way is to optimize over flow of latency and price vectors. But let's remember this flow of latency plots of the roads. If we know whether we are in free flow or in the congested regime, the green or the brown lines here, um, the, then latency is fully defined by, um, by the flow values then we can introduce this binary variable S to denote free flow and congested regions and replace the latency in the optimization with variable S. And this is preferable because it's a discrete variable. We will be able to loop over it. Also, remember we defined a longest equilibrium road. Let's call that road K. And we know that all roads that are faster in free flow will be congested. So we can just search over K and the remaining part of the S vector. Now let's look at the constraints. Road dynamics assert that the sum of human driven and autonomous flow cannot exceed the maximum flow. For the human choice model, uh, remember we computed the ratio of users who choose road I and our pricing uh, framework has to respect that. 
So we will distribute the total uh, autonomous demand lambda A into the road using these ratios. Okay. Profit constraint will simply make sure the total income minus the total gas cost is larger than some threshold. And uh, for the selfishness constraint, uh, the, this is the most difficult one. First of all, we have to allocate all regular vehicle demand. Next, the roads that are longer than the longest equilibrium road will have no regular vehicle flow. This is again uh, due to equilibrium uh, definitions. And the remaining roads uh, will have the same latency as it's an H equilibrium. And finally, the latency of the longest equilibrium road cannot exceed the free flow latency of the next road, which is longer, again, due to the equilibrium definition. Uh, now, this optimization optimization is non-convex, so we just resort to local optima in this case. Uh, we cannot put this as a uh, linear program or any convex program, especially because of the profit constraints. Now, we investigated how well our price optimization performs. We first varied the theta term here. What we expect to see is a trade-off curve like this, where increasing theta uh, allows us to allocate more flow in the cost of increased latency. And we want to be close to the star on the corner. When we run our optimization with various data, we indeed observe this trade-off. This result shows one can play with uh, this theta parameter to set the trade-off between delay and throughput. We also conducted a user study where we recruited 21 real users. For each user, we learned their preference parameters through 40 actively generated queries, and then run our price optimization for this population of users for five different traffic networks, each with four roads as I show here. Using these prices and latency estimates from the optimization, we asked the same users their choices uh, to get the actual results. And finally, we computed the best selfish Nash equilibria where all vehicles are selfish. And as you can see, our pricing algorithm outperforms the best selfish Nash equilibria when both of them allocate the same amount of flow. And this means we successfully incentivize altruism through pricing. Just to summarize, we developed a pricing method for autonomous ride hailing services to reduce traffic congestion. Our framework can also be used to optimize other social scale objectives such as uh, air pollution. Uh, or more related to these days, it can be used to minimize risk of infection. Uh, we realized the use of public transportation has declined due to the pandemic and it's recovering much slower than other modes of transportation. This is causing additional congestion problems. In a very recent work, we developed pricing methods to balance the trade-off between congestion and the risk of infection. And I want to finish by discussing our future directions and how to build on this work. One possible venue is scalability. Currently, we are feeding all network information into the RL policy, but a more scalable approach would extract some predictive features and feed them into the policy. Also, we did all our experiments on simulated networks. Some of them matched with real existing networks, but human driver's behavior was still simulated. Besides, it's not clear how well a policy trained in simulation will transfer to the real world. And finally, another direction is how we incentivize the altruism in the dynamic formulation. Uh, with this, uh, I will leave this video of the three road parallel network playing here with selfish routing and reinforcement learning routing, and I can take any questions. Thank you, Dem, uh, for the talk. Are there any questions from the audience? If yes, you can unmute yourself and simply ask. Uh, thank you. I actually have a question, um, which is more about the, the first part, but I think in general, it also uh, it also relevant for the second part. So, so I was wondering, uh, to what extent do you rely on having parallel uh, networks? So I guess for the equilibrium um, characterization, is, is it needed, I guess? But um, like, how do you, like, can you somehow um, see any network as a, some, as a it's like a composition of parallel networks and can somehow generalize the results or it's very really right. crucial to have mm -hmm. uh, parallel um, networks. Yeah, there, there are a few ways we can generalize, although they are, um, they are kind of trivial generalizations. So for example, 
we can handle networks that are like that are series of parallel networks. Uh, it's a it's 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 a yeah. simple generalization. Um, but other than that, so to characterize the equilibrium, we can write the optimization even if the uh, network is not a parallel network. The problem is that optimization problem is not a convex optimization anymore. Um, so like we, we can still formulate it, but uh, we will not know if it's like if it's the global optimum uh, when we solve it. Um, and because of this, like in the steady state analysis, I focused on parallel networks. Yeah, um, okay, I see. But but uh, uh, but uh, like bizarre, um, apart from um, like computational advantages, do you think that um, equilibria or like this um, uh, some problem or like uh, um, um, basically uh, uh, inefficiencies of travel times are mostly uh, visible in in parallel networks or or like uh, can you think about non-parallel network problem where you may have very large inefficiency uh, outside the equilibrium because i was wondering if, what if i mean in in practice if uh, if maybe what we only care about is is really private uh, parallel links mm -hmm. um yeah for like in terms of computation um i for example one like random thought is uh like as long as the, the the roads merge only at the end, you, it might be possible to model like branching in like at different levels of the network. Um, yeah, the, the, the problem is usually with like merge merge. Um, I see. Yeah, but I'm like uh, I I I haven't really studied that, so I I don't really know if it's still going to be a linear program or convex program. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, thanks. Any other question? Actually, can, can I ask a couple? Um, I had the question based on, so where, where do you see these applied? Uh, because you, you solved a couple of uh, case studies, you know, with these uh, different networks with the parallel roads. But I'm wondering, what's the final goal? Do you think of it as a way which one day you could do online routing? Mm -hmm. Because uh, if, if, if I may think, if the answer is yes, um, then I wonder how can you make it scale to have, uh, you know, to, to the full network with a lot of roads, most of which are not parallel, right. heterogeneous preferences, all, you know, the, the full package of, of complexity of the right. system. Yeah. Yeah, um, so I think in terms of applicability, um, yeah, the, the, the reinforcement learning by itself is not very realistic because like we're assuming control over like autonomous cars in the network, right? Uh, that's, that's, a, that's a very like big assumption. But um, I think it has some uses by if we consider public transportation. So um, like we, we don't have control over people's cars but uh, like municipalities or the states, uh, depending on governors or like, let's say some, some authorities have control over uh, the routes of buses. Um, so we can actually use a similar framework, maybe instead of reinforcement learning, it's a Bayesian optimization in this case or something like that. Uh, they can optimize the routes of buses. And if buses are an important portion of the traffic network, which is usually the case in Europe, for example, uh, then, the, the, then this might help with traffic congestion. Um, and then, and then the second question, yeah, the scalability of this, uh, can we really scale to the like real city scale, uh, networks? Um, so with reinforcement learning, it's difficult. Uh, like it, it, it requires a lot of computation, uh, and like very, it, it requires a lot of computation time and computation power at the same time. Uh, but I think we can develop algorithms that uh, solve this problem in a hierarchical way. So I'm thinking of an hierarchical reinforcement learning approach where uh, some sub policies solve like sub networks and then a high level uh, policy routes the cars between these sub networks. So it's like a city has different zones, right? 
So each zone has its own RL policy. And then people are also moving between zones and those flows are uh, regulated by this like high level policy, something like that. And this, this would uh, increase scalability I think, like significantly. Okay. Um, and a second question I had was more, that's more of a, maybe, maybe you're already looking at it for the second steps or so. Uh, and all of these applications I've seen, you, you are kind of minimizing a common metric for all the vehicles, like be it total delay, or you could also think of cost or whatever. Um, how would the approach change if you think that every agent has a different cost function? Mm -hmm maybe dependent on other things like costs. Uh, if you think about intermodal networks, number of times you switch from one uh, mode to the other. I mean, what if you assume some distribution of people instead of having the same cost function over every right. agent? Yeah, so for the, for the last part of the talk where I talk about pricing, um, each user has actually their own reward function. Uh, so they are trying to optimize their reward function while choosing their routes. Uh, but as the system designer, yes, we are still trying to minimize the total delay. Um, one alternative formulation is instead of minimizing total delay and maximizing the served flow, uh, we could try to maximize the like total rewards people got. And when I say reward, these are personalized reward functions. Um, but then there are some problems uh, like related to fairness uh, because then like you, you, sometimes you start caring more about uh, people who give more importance to either latency or price and then there is like all these i think new questions about like if you if you care more about someone who give more importance to latency that means your system is biased in favor of the rich people, right? And- uh, Exactly, I was exactly thinking about this kind of things because if you think about it also with total delay, uh, at least when I work with these kind of problems, you, you end up having solutions in which, yeah, on average, everyone is happy, but there are few minorities which take three hours instead of 10 minutes just to right, make right, the full right. solution converge, right? So, right. Yeah, like in, 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 in the pricing uh, framework, the way we kind of justify that is like, those people are paying less and it's, a, it's, it's, like, an, it's like an optional thing, uh, right? Uh, but I mean, yeah, there is, I, I think that it's, it's, it's a very valid ethical question. Uh, so the, the, like, do you, do you want the same price for this, from the same origin to destination? Uh, I, I don't think it's necessarily the case, but there should be some limits on kind of how much you can exploit this pricing scheme. Like, like you, you shouldn't be able to increase latency for some people, maybe like larger than some factor. So similar to our altruism profile thing, maybe the maximum latency you should be allowed to offer to users must be like, I don't know, 1.5 times the nominal delay or something like that but yeah that's a, that's an that's an ethical question and uh it's a i i think it's a great question but uh i don't know then i don't know the answer to that it's like and like yeah no one person should be uh, responsible for that <laughs> okay i have maybe a final question i don't want to take all this the time but um so I, I, I was wondering if there was a specific reason why you chose this level of, of abstraction. That's not maybe more a philosophical question uh, because um, I see you are doing these sumo simulations. They are mm -hmm. kind of micro simulations, right. but the assumption sometimes, at least for the first part of the talk, the assumptions you put on the dynamics of the vehicles per se might allow you to think about network flow problems on a higher perspective, like you, where you don't really care about where on the arc the car actually is. Uh, you, don't have a, you don't even have cells. You just have an arc and you have a flow mm -hmm. on that arc, right? Uh, and that might even simplify some of, the <laughs> some of the things that happen later. So I was wondering, is there a specific reason why, why, why you chose to work at this level? Especially thinking when you will need to do this for a whole city. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it is my... 
I, I remember that this kind of simulations really take yeah. a lot of uh, a lot yeah. of computation and time to to run. Yeah. So when we when, when we started this like like traffic routing problem in general, um, we were looking from the more like theoretical perspective. We were trying to come up with like analytical solutions, and that's why we started from these like, uh, like simple network topologies. Uh, or like from from like the, the, the this this perspective, um, and then later uh, we had this idea of using reinforcement learning, but we still wanted to be able to like compare this reinforcement learning solution to the optimal solution because like uh, uh, otherwise it's, it's it's difficult to evaluate the performance. Like we can compare with other methods, but it's also not clear if other methods are you know doing uh, good compared to the like best steady state, and uh, like that's why like even when we Kind of generalize with reinforcement learning, we are still uh, like considering small networks. Uh, but I, and again, like computation is also a bottleneck uh, for reinforcement learning. Okay, thank you. Uh, is there any final question, maybe? I don't see anybody muting. I think if you, you can reach out to them in case you have deeper thoughts or you want a, a follow-up discussion. Thank you very much for the talk. Wish you a great uh, success. I, I, it is my understanding that you're looking for jobs. So good luck with that. Right. Thank you. Uh, and uh, for the next steps and uh, for the audience, see you all next week for the next autonomy talk. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank you for having me. Bye. Thank you.